Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, operational resilience is the name of the game, and we already have an issue with our webcam. So uh, apologies for that if you can't see us and we can't see you. But I'm hoping that you can see the slides. So we're going to test this now, whether somebody from the attend attendees, if you could just somehow respond to me uh, by telling us that you can see the slides. That would be, that would be brilliant. Okay, I will kick off. So welcome to the third meeting of the non-executive directors and chief risk officers special interest group. Aileen and I are really uh, pleased to have you here and, and thanks for uh, attending. Uh, we're the co-chairs of this group and funnily enough we uh, set this up uh, in February just before Covid uh, really hit, hit us hard. So I'm really pleased to see such a good turnout today. Uh, in this new virtual way of, of doing things and hope that you um, will find this informative, um, useful, thought-provoking and of course attend future sessions as well. So the topic of today is operational resilience. Um, it's not only a strategic imperative for organisations but also a new set of challenging regulatory requirements. With increased regulatory scrutiny and coupled with the current pandemic that we're living through, operational resilience has been elevated into the boardroom. So we thought we'd bring you all together with these esteemed speakers today um, to, to have a number of experts, practitioners, who will provide their thoughts and their perspectives. So first off, we'll hear from Jose about regulatory requirements on operational resilience and what this actually means for boards. Jenny will then explain from her experience some of the practical challenges whilst implementing an operational resilience program at HSBC. And then we'll go on to a panel discussion with Ronan and Aileen, who will join and discuss organizational readiness and lessons learned from responding to the current pandemic. I'd like to encourage you throughout this uh, webinar to ask questions, send your comments. There is a, a, a chat box, I hope that you can see that on the right hand side. Uh, to me or the entire audience, and I'll be monitoring that throughout throughout the day. Um, we are recording this session, uh, and we'll make this session available later on after the after today. And we'll also come out to you with a survey with some practical uh, questions that, uh, that we can then feed back to you with results uh, later on. So there's quite a few of quite a bit of um, communication coming out of this. So without further ado, I understand that you can see the slides. Um, I'd like to invite Jose to give us his view on regulatory expectations, uh, what he thinks about uh, should be the key considerations for the NEDs, um, and also what, what do boards need to know at this point in time. Jose, may I invite yeah. you to take the, the floor? Oh, thank you, Socrates. Um, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Morago, Managing Director of Action Risk Advisory and also former Chair of the Institute of Risk Management, for those of you who don't know me. If we can move to the first slide, please. So, fall seven times, stand up eight. I, I love this Japanese proverb when I think about the true essence of resilience. And, and psychologists define resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity. And if anything, COVID-19 has brought to light the true ingredients of resilience. When I think about the world of business and the upcoming regulatory requirements on operational resilience, I also think about that resilience is more about having the right mindset than a process. And in fact, if we have seen the high-profile disruptions events like the TSPs, IT meltdown, or the Tesco bank cyber attacks, Rather than weaknesses in the process, the real causes were issues with cultural organization, the level of challenge for the board, the effectiveness of the communication flow, as well as clarity of uh, accountability. 
So given this context, uh, beyond a set of uh, rules and regulatory artifacts, uh, regulators really expect to see how organizations bring to life the concept of resilience, how they link business outcomes to regulatory requirements. And from this perspective, clearly the board, non-executive directors, the management team and CROs have a, clear, a, a significant role to play on bringing to life operational resilience. Can we move the slides, Socrates? Of course. So before getting into the software elements, let me just recap, uh, just to make sure that we, I give you an overview of the regulatory requirements on operational resilience. And this is just a very high level. Um, there is obviously plenty of material coming from the regulators. But in December 2019, the FCA, the PRA, and the Bank of England uh, published a final consultation paper on operational resilience, setting clear standards uh, for firms. And, and the, the key components from, I would say, from the regulatory artifacts perspective are about identifying important business services. And this is about identifying from the point of view of the end user. This is not an internal view. This is more understanding how the end user interact with your organization. So for example, it's about identifying as important business services a payment. So for example, access to an ATM or a domestic transfer or, or an insurance settlement. All these uh, key business services need to be mapped and identified. When, once you identify these business, important business services, uh, the important thing is to identify a mark or articulate a maximum level of disruption around these, uh, these uh, business services. And so it is identifying a, a point at which a, a consumer may face harm. And this will allow firms to identify and to manage their operational resilience. The third uh, element connected to uh, regulatory expectations is defining actions, the actions that firms will take to really ensure that the business services are able to remain within the impact tolerance. And this means that really demonstrating that the board and the executives and the management team really are taking actions in terms of improving the infrastructure, improving the system capacity, building the redundancy and ensuring that they have uh, key people and capabilities to respond and to ensure that they remain within tolerance. The fourth element of these uh, operational resilience requirements are around mapping these business services in more detail, having proper testing and self-assessments, and really having a documented way to see how you will manage operational resilience. All of these really bring a set of additional expectations for board, boards. And, and this is not a surprise. I mean, obviously, the, as I said, regulators expect board members and expect that the resilience is led from the top with a clear role from non-executive directors, the management teams, and, 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 and CROs in this case as well. So there are a number of explicit requirements coming from the PRA, the FCA, and also recently from the Bank of International Settlements around how boards should be involved in this topic starting from playing a key role in setting and overseeing the implementation of the firm's approach to operational resilience, but also ensuring that they have a clear involvement in prioritizing the business services, reviewing the testing plans, getting involved into the scenario analysis, and having really access to information so they can they support and decide on operational resilience. It's just important to say that individual members will not necessarily to be will require to be technical experts on operational resilience, but collectively they need to have the knowledge, the skill, and the expertise to provide constructive challenge to the senior management teams. And this is a, a significant challenge and, uh, and a learning curve for board members because uh, many of the boards of our financial services banks or insurance companies are quite used to what I would call financial resilience and managing the financial profile and capital profile, but operational resilience is a new dimension. So there is a lot of uh, learning and a potential set of challenges for board members in terms of getting uh, familiar with uh, managing operational resilience. Can we move to the next slide? So those are really, as I said, the regulatory artifacts. But as I said, I will go back to my, my early comments um, because through operational resilience, it really built into a sense, a clear sense of purpose, a clear ownership and accountability, as well as effective stakeholder management and communication flows. 
And this means that from, from, from my point of view, when, when you think about operational resilience, um, there are a number of softer elements that you need to keep in mind. And I think these are quite relevant for today's discussion. First of all, purpose and mindset. As I said, well, there is a risk that operational resilience is treated like another compliance exercise. So I think bringing the organization on board with the operational resilience agenda is quite critical. And as I said, boards and senior management should play a significant role of making sure that they have this debate internally and they can support the, the really find a way to link business outcomes to and benefits to regulatory requirements. Second area, um, I think an important area as well is uh, capabilities. Although the existing operational resilience processes and frameworks are not new, really the new expectations around operational resilience are, are really um, uh, a step up. And I think it's important for firms to understand their internal weaknesses. And obviously we know some of the areas of challenge like, for example, data, data protection, third party risks, outsourcing, cybersecurity. These are areas where you need to really fully understand your, your vulnerabilities from the operational resilience standpoint. Uh, another point very quickly to mention is as well is accountability. So this is a quite complex uh, multidimensional um, activity, operational resilience that we have seen with COVID-19. And this requires even from the implementation standpoint, a clear set of accountabilities and responsibilities. But unlike many other previous re risk management regulations, I will say in this case, the regulators have been very clear that this, this needs to be owned by the first line. And there is a very clear role for the chief operations officer, for the CEO and SMF24 in terms of leading and being responsible for the delivering of the operational resilience policy, but also managing the operational resilience as a whole. And, and as I mentioned, this is a potential significant challenge for CEOs, uh, the wire management team. And I think the CRO actually, which is quite relevant for today's discussion, should play a role on educating and helping the organization navigate this challenge. My final comment is really, as I said, it's quite important to link the business outcomes to the regulatory requirements and making operational resilience something real, something that can really bring value and success for the organization. And we have seen that this has been quite critical uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. And as uh, Socrates said, this is more, it's an strategic imperative. So with that, I will stop and I will, I, I guess we will discuss later in the panel discussion, but I will pass the word to Jenny. So that's great. Thank you so much. Jenny, hope you can see your slides. I can. Thank you very much, Socrates. Um, I put all my points on one slide. So um, if you can move to the, the next slide and then I'll, I'll cover off each in detail. So um, as you've heard from Jose, um, the regulation is, is emerging and evolving. Um, so we've still got that evolving regulatory landscape and approach. Um, and we're also starting to see, I think, in that regulation, um, challenges of um, balancing uh, principles-based regulation in some cases with maybe more prescriptive regulation, maybe more in, from the local regulators. So we set out in terms of uh, the regulation, probably the first was the Bank of England joint PRA and FCA consultation paper that Jose mentioned in July 18. And that followed really off the back of a series of um, failures such as the TSB failure. And clearly the aim there was really to get um, a resilient financial system in the UK. And what we've seen looking at that regulation from the Bank of England through the PRA and the FCA is that the focus of the regulation is very much on the customer and ensuring that we continue to provide resilient services to our customers throughout any incidents. More recently, uh, BCBS in August 20 published its consultation paper at the same time as it's updated its principles for the same management of operational risk and as an organization we've just had to go back in November um, with our uh, feedback on that consultation paper on both of them 
the good news there is that BCBS is actually aligning um, with PS more, um, which is, is good because it means we can use our existing um, operational or non-financial risk management frameworks that we've established um, in line with uh, Basel III to actually then manage resilience risk as well. So we don't have to develop a separate framework for, for managing resilience risk. That again is a principles-based approach, which is positive. Um, and there's broad alignment between those two sets of regulation. But they do use different terms, for example, which, which challenges us as a global organization in HSBC and as the other local regulators that we deal with, such as the OCC and the FRB in the US, or perhaps MAS in Singapore, start to build out their regulation um, and driving then a consistent approach to managing the risk through our frameworks across the global organization and, and indeed across the industry um, is, is quite challenging. So we've seen different terminology, as I said, in things such as critical operations is a term instead of uh, business, important business services. And in our view, that reflects a more traditional firm first approach to resilience rather than the customer first approach that the PRA and FCA joint regulation set out. And the expectation that current business continuity and incident management approaches will cater for more severe events. And I think in, in managing through COVID, we found that maybe that's not the case. So as I said, those differences in regulatory requirements and approaches cause us as challenges, particularly as a global organization, to implement ineffectively uh, and you know, um, getting that consistent approach. Where do we set the bar? Um, globally uh, and that leads on to all of the then the day-to-day -day risk management the reporting into our governance how we aggregate and manage that risk at the global level as well indeed um Lyndon Nelson the uh, deputy CEO of the PRA uh, speaking in June 2019 um, also talked about the need for the industry to collaborate further. And this is something, I guess, historically we've not really done um, to the extent that maybe will be required going forwards to effectively manage some of the challenges we face from uh, operational resilience and some of the risks that present to us. Um, he sees it as a step change in uh, industry collaboration um, in terms of the establishment of the Financial Sector Collaboration Centre, which is an important body. Um, and obviously through that, we'll need to drive more industry collaboration. This does need an industry joined up approach to tackle some of the threats we face and that can impact our operational resilience, such as some of the cyber threats, for example. And we need to do more to share information then across the industry to help us all manage that risk. One of the key things I think in terms of challenges is the accountabilities and responsibilities as well. Uh, and alignment to other regulations, I think you've heard Jose already mentioned the senior manager regime and the SMF 24 role in particular as a key role uh, in driving the management of resilience risk. Some things that we've done in HSBC um, more recently in responding to resilience risk man matters is to build out an additional role within our three lines of defense framework. And that's something that we've called the business service owner role. And that's really to get that focus on the business services, which is so critical um, to the management of operational resilience. And that role we really see as the gatekeeper for the products and the processes. Um, and really nothing should be changed to their services and processes without their approval going forwards. If we look then at some of the governance challenges, um, as you can see here, some of the things that we're grappling with at the moment in HSBC is, is the role of the board in the day-to-day -day management of resilience risk. 
and how much they get involved on a day-to-day -day basis and how much they get involved, for example, in incident management. And this is clearly quite a bit of work that's still required in this particular area. And we're looking at running simulations regularly on a regular basis with the board to actually look then at that role and, and, and what role they play, particularly in incident management. But it's also in terms of what do they want to see on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the MI and reporting. They clearly want to get a more proactive view of the risk um, and be more preventative. Um, and how do we do that? Uh, and what is the level of MI that they then need to see? And in line with that then, um, challenges in defining clear escalation paths. What do we escalate and when and to whom? And is that different based upon the different incidents, based upon the different impacts that we see or disruption levels? I've talked already briefly about informing the top of the house view and clearly to do that we do need a consistent and proactive set of reporting and MI and that brings its own challenges and how we aggregate and it goes back to then that my first point around consistency as well. And then once we've got that MI and we're involved in the active day-to-day -day risk management, how do we actually demonstrate and evidence that oversight? What is our audit trail? How do we create that audit trail? Um, how much goes through formal governance versus is more informal? And how do we capture and evidence that, particularly uh, in terms of our regulators? I think the regulators have indicated that they're looking more for a self-assessment type approach with clear oversight and challenge, um, but with periodic review and approval by the boards. That's how we build that in then, within our existing structures, within our three lines of defence models. And then if we look particularly at the assessment and management of the risk itself and the processes that we will implement to do that, we absolutely need to get full end-to-end -end assessments that cover our processes, our business services, our customer journeys, and the customer experience itself, the customer outcomes as well, really. In terms of mapping the services and processes, we need to look at both the materiality and the disruption events as well. And I would, challenge, I would say one of the key challenges is that getting that full end-to-end -end assessment and mapping is a big piece of work. And the effort involved in them maintaining and keeping it up to date is, is quite a, an, an overhead and challenge, I think, for many organisations. Particularly if you have a number of triggers and, and you need to review in response to all of those triggers. And with that in mind, we need to understand what are all of those triggers for review? Do we, do we have the full set of triggers? And can we identify when they occur? And how do we communicate that to make sure that we are being proactive and reviewing across the entire organisation? So it's doing that read across as well. Um, and then in terms of the process is defining and maintaining realistic impact tolerances that are based upon that materiality and level of disruption that can be tolerated. Do we know what our maximum level of disruption is that can be tolerated? Absolutely key to this is doing testing and monitoring of the controls. And how do we then define plausible but severe scenarios? Um, obviously, COVID has challenged some of the thinking on that. Um, I guess most people would not have had that type of event on their radar to maybe do a dry run scenario of and manage um, ahead of COVID actually breaking. Um, and, and that's certainly causing us to rethink uh, in some areas as well about how we do that. And then I'd also say as well, in terms of those end-to-end -end assessments and the management of risk, 
is assessing our risks relating to the use of third parties, as Jose says, but also fourth and even fifth parties. And clearly understanding the dependencies that we have on them, but also how they build out our resilience as well. And what's their level of resilience to similar types of risk and what do they do to test and manage those risks? Something else I think that's key to do is to consider horizon scanning and what's on the horizon, what's on the future, and present that information as well to the board on a regular basis. Within HSBC, one of the things that we've actually done to start looking at this as that regulation emerges is to undertake a pilot that really tests our approach and our level of compliance with the proposed regulations against those four elements that Jose set out at the outset. We picked two important business services. One was the term lending for our commercial business and the other was access to cash for our retail businesses. We kicked that off in June 20 and it's just completed. So it was um, probably about a four month piece of work. And the aim of it was really to identify any gaps in compliance and to look at how we may address those. So that has been useful for us to maybe understand some more of the challenges in terms of compliance with the regulation that's now coming out. One final thought that I'll leave um, the uh, attendees with is also in terms of how you structure your organisation and consider then whether you need a dedicated resilience subcommittee of your board, for example, to manage this risk in the short term until you get up to speed with that active day-to-day -day management. Socrates, I'll hand back there. Hopefully I've covered some of the key challenges that uh, we've certainly got in HSBC as a global organisation. Thank you, Jenny. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, I've had a few questions. I'm just trying to distill them into a, into a message. So um, we've got uh, over 45 attendees, uh, both in financial services and non-financial services. So uh, the, the question here is about You've mentioned reviews and you've mentioned this, this wave of, of, of um, intricate uh, uh, looking into the risks from a, from a resilience standpoint in, in the bank. Um, has this, have, the, have these reviews drawn attention to the business leaders in the bank uh, around the, the, the requirement for risk professionals uh, and perhaps having such risk professionals as part of the leadership team, um, sometimes rather than, than in support, support roles? What, what's your view on that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. And um, in HSBC, um, in 2018, in response to um, the Emerging Resilience Regulation, we did actually um, split out and create a dedicated resilience risk function uh, and brought in an industry subject matter expert to head up that function and to uh, act as, as a consultant to our board uh, and to really establish um, a, a good resilience risk capability within the wider organization. But what we're now doing as that has matured in, in the last couple of years is now bringing that together with our wider operational risk function. So we're bringing those two aspects back together because they're so inextricably linked and you know, resilience risk just hit on so many of our other non-financial risks. Um, so we're bringing it back into a kind of integrated team um, to get that holistic view and approach. Um, but absolutely, I think you know, the requirement for SMEs in this space um, within your organization um, at quite a senior level who can challenge um, the first line and you know provide input to your board is, is essential I think yeah. Brilliant. I'm just going to ask another question and then conscious of the time that we're sort of halfway through. Um, what processes did you go through when determining your maximum possible period of disruption? 
Um, we've worked with our businesses, and 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 this is this is one of the things you know that I'm I'm trying to set out here. Don't underestimate the challenge of this, the amount of effort that's involved in in doing these processes to get to that stage. Um, it's required both first and second line sitting down around a table in workshops um, to start looking. We we've defined. Um, what we think are plausible scenarios and, and work those through. So we've got, you know, particular storylines um, of events that we think would happen and then we, we work those through with those um, first and second line um, attendees and look at, you know, what would happen in that event uh, or what do we think would happen to try and drive then, you know, what, what can we actually tolerate and, and, you know, where would we you know, um, maybe flip over that appetite for us. Um, it's obviously we've looked very much and very strongly from from a HSBC perspective at the the customer and the conduct aspects in particular uh, in defining those you know maximum disruption and it's what's the disruption really you know for that end customer um, and that's basically how we've gone about it. But it's it's a huge amount of, of work and effort you know it's still evolving it's not a one-off piece of work you know again at council is that they would change over time and you need to keep revisiting them as well um based upon you know the situations and circumstances um which you know can be the external environment for example and that may have an impact on your your disruption levels and appetite That was brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for your help. Um, I'm, I'll just carry on monitoring questions as we go through. Um, if I'd now like to uh, invite uh, Ronan and um, Aileen to join our panel. Uh, I know it's virtual and we can't see each other, but um, we've got a, quite a few questions lined up for, for our panel. Um, we're discussing organi organizational readiness and lessons learned from responding to the pandemic. Um, so a couple of questions, if I may may kick off with the first one, and this has to do with readiness. So um, how ready do you think companies have been on operational resilience during the pandemic? Eileen, um, would you like to take that one? Yes, yeah, yeah, happy to. Um, I think Jenny touched on the key point here, which is what has organisations' visualisation of the environment been in the run-up to the coronavirus pandemic you know my perspective on that is that and i know it's a wide question and a you know a, a, the wide response but that it's been principles based in that there has been a perspective that any outage would be of a non-prolonged nature and organizational specific not infrastructure or socially um, in impact, that there would be a reliance on physical interaction and physical locations. And I think one of the things that coronavirus has taught organisations, and I think there are a good few learnings, is that the actual stressed environment that most organisations have considered when they've thought about operational resilience has been far too narrow and that there is a real direct link between the execution or the ability to execute your business strategy and your responsibilities to whether it's your clients, your direct customers, to your regulatory obligations, sits really strongly rooted in your ability to understand have you in line with your business strategy committed to resilience by design? Now, those of us in the IT community or who have you know, significant transformation experience will understand that cybersecurity and security by design is just an absolute basic when considering the launch of new products and new services and offerings to clients. But I think the coronavirus scenario has really brought back full circle that it is no longer acceptable and or appropriate from a macro perspective 
to consider operational resilience as a stress scenario in the same way that one would do to identify which capital to hold, how much solvency to have, liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the accountability for me here in responding to this and in making sure that an organization has appropriate resilience by design sits with the CEO and the board in asking the question, when formulating the business strategy, when the focus is on the balance sheet, the sector, the segments, the revenue, the margin, the profitability, is to ask the question, what is resilience by design that will just be a cost of doing business that will enable us to effectively deliver on the strategy? And what percentage of that will be human fronted? What percentage will require physical locations? And what percentage of that will be truly digital? Because that also informs how much investment you put into those risk protocols, protections, and digital capabilities as part of your innovation or your change budget. Yeah. Um, thank, thanks, Aileen. Um, Socrates, should I pitch in here? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, if you could, Ronan. Yes, please. Yes. Um, yes, as, as, as I said at the beginning, um, Ronan McCaughey from Insurance ERM Publications. So uh, we cover all aspects of risk and capital management in the insurance industry uh, worldwide. And what we're hearing is, is a very positive story from insurers in, uh, during COVID-19. This was the mother of all stress tests. And uh, the insurance industry, to be fair, seems to have passed well. Um, you know, operationally, so they've had to plan out people management, how to split teams for protection purposes, how to manage the space, how to ensure people are connected. You know, pretty much overnight, and I'm sure Socrates, uh, you'll also echo this with your experience that you know insurers had to move thousands of people uh, to you know to work from home, remote working with with laptops and increased bandwidth and VPN and so on. And you know, speaking to lots and lots of them as 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 we do. It seems to have managed smoothly. You know, uh, certainly I haven't heard of, of any insurers um, coming a cropper um, ha having any any issues. So that's that's good. I mean, that, that's that's obviously very good from a uh, business and a customer perspective. Outsourcing also seems to have been uh, managed pretty well. Quite a few insurers have operations in India, but they said that their partners there, for example, have have done a very good job. Um, another key point is that you know with staff working from home, it's quite amazing. I mean, a, a lot of people have said to me, if this had happened a year ago, or if, if you had, um, if you thought about it, you know, such a dramatic change, you, you would have wondered if the insurance industry would have been able, been able to do it. But again, a lot of insurers tell me that their productivity metrics have, have held up well. Uh, of course, they're using all the digital tools that, that we all use, uh, Skype, Zoom, and, and, and so on. The only, the only downside, so it's a, it's a, it's a positive story uh, overall, certainly from what, uh, from what I'm hearing is, but that the only issue is that, and it was touched on by other speakers, there is the cyber risk. Um, so I'm, I'm being told that, yes, insurers are having a lot more cyber attacks, a lot more phishing has really dramatically increased, uh, 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 one person was telling me um, last week. So that, that's an issue for them, and they're really having to um, yeah, ma manage that. Um, but as I say, I mean, you know, the resilience strategy has uh, has has been been very good. A lot of them have also run a number of COVID stress testing scenarios to understand what would happen if they lost critical infrastructure um, that the home working is dependent on. So, you know, they feel that they're they're planning, um, especially since the financial crisis has actually worked well for them uh, during this one. And uh, they all agree that operational risk is going to become even more important. Um, going forward, it's, it's not something that it's just a, the bag of the, the CRO. It's actually everyone needs to take responsibility for it because it's, it's, it's so crucial. But I would say the one issue that they're all concerned about is say, is, is, is is cyber risk. Um, a lot of the insurers are using cloud cloud based tools um, for technology. Um, so yeah, that that's going to be an, an area um, going forward. But you know, it's it's been a, you know if I re if I was reviewing the homework, it's been an excellent job so far. That's that's great. It sort of leads me to the next question of what what do you think companies have learned about their operational response then uh, during this pandemic? Um, 
Oh, but I, I mean, I mean, is that for is that for me, um, Doctor? Maybe I'll just take the. It's, 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 uh, it's rather you, but I think um, uh, Alien could, could take that one because you, you kind yeah. of led straight into that sort of you know yeah. lessons learned. But I just want to you know get get your perspectives of of what, what are the actual lessons learned um, from from companies. Yeah, look, look, happy to take that. You know, I think to Ronan's point, you know, many, many organisations have learned about the strength of their human capital, the ability to execute on remote digital connectivity. And, and, and I think there's been, you know, many, many firms in, in the industry that have both been very satisfied with the results in people working remotely and taking what would have been, you know, stress test invocation testings fully in anger into live and for, you know, long, consistent periods of time. I think that's on the positive side of how do you mobilise from the early days of, of, of coronavirus. I think what organisations have also learned is about um, the larger people agenda and um, you know, colleague resilience. And I think um, the number of activities, the conversations, the people check-ins, and whether the people strategy as was is sufficient in a fully remote working environment versus an environment that might have been 80-20, with the 20% of the time being in stress scenarios. I certainly know from talking to uh, you know a number of fellow NEDs on on various boards, both in the the banking sector and out with, that re-looking at their people strategy, um, I think is one of the key learnings. Not that they haven't been robust, but the fact that the people strategy has to be designed for almost a different paradigm. Now, whether that means what is the future of working from home, what employees will. Um, you know, what hiring decisions will have to have to be made, what type of individuals respond in, in certain environments, what roles can be fully remote and, and how do they lend themselves, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think on the more work to do, it's back to my earlier point that, you know, effectively your resilient strategy has to be refreshed at the same time as your business strategy, your cyber strategy, your capital and liquidity strategy, your solvency strategy, you know, there effectively is a wheel and spoke between your business strategy, people, security by design and resilience. And I think the best organisations who will win the race will be those organisations that understand the interplay and the connectivity of same. Yeah, so, yeah totally. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, if, if I may as well, from the experience of HSBC, one of the key learnings for us was how we make very, very many business decisions at real pace. You know, we had to respond very quickly. We had literally hundreds of business decisions that we needed to make to make sure we continued to support the customer. Um, and I'm sure many of you have had processes, as we do in in place in HSBC that normally those decisions are not made you know instantaneously um, and the challenge was I think about getting the right business and risk people around the table quickly to both make those decisions at pace but make sure we absolutely considered the risks at the same time uh, and that was with not without its challenges I think uh, and what that's one of the things that we've learned, how we how we can sort of streamline and simplify those processes to really make those decisions that pace. And what we're looking at now is to kind of keep the best of that, you know, making decisions that pace whilst absolutely, you know, balancing the management of the risk as well and getting that risk input. Um, I was just going to add to, to that, um, those very good points. Um, certainly, I'm hearing a lot of people saying, think the unthinkable. Um, surprisingly, some insurers have said to me that they didn't see the pandemic. It wasn't a it wasn't a big risk on their radar, which I do find a bit surprising given SARS and so on. But um, they are now busy um, thinking about all the other risks that that, that could come on the radar. So um, whilst they also agree that they don't want people turning into Doctor No, 
um, that they have to be able to, you know, you have, you have to be able to see opportunities as well. But I say operational res resilience is, is front and centre of insurance planning. Um, we, we talked about there as well about uh, remote working. Again, I mean, like, throughout the financial services sector, I am hearing that um, there's going to be a middle ground that we're not going back to the office um, five days a week for, for a lot of companies. It's going to be a blend, um, two to three days in the office and so on. People will come to the office for connecting and getting meetings done. And then, as, as uh, Aileen also mentioned, uh, people risk. I think I think what, throughout the whole pandemic, and just in broader society, we all realise how connected we are and how different risks are interconnected. We all need each other. Um, and the, this, the, the importance of mental health and so on and emotional resilience is uh, really important. And you know, lots and lots of insurers are focusing on virtual drinks and uh, gin o'clock. So some of them are having virtual Christmas dinners. Um, I'm even hearing about more, a little bit more creative things like virtual walks, um, one insurer doing a virtual walk to Barcelona, where they have a certain amount of steps where they have to do the teams. Um, but I think that everyone realizes that, you know, I think people think that perhaps younger people, oh, they're okay. I mean, they're, they're young, they'll bounce back. But what I'm hearing is actually, they're the ones that are most affected by this. They mightn't have the networking skills. They don't have the list of contacts we've all had, and they really miss the, that, uh, the social interaction. So you know, they, they really need to be looked after. And um, yeah, insurers are really uh, telling me, I think all companies are to be making this uh, a big priority for them. If, if I could add, just just building on on these points, and, and maybe just to add a different angle to to the lessons learned, and maybe just to how to move forward. I mean, when I when I talk to clients, in particular in the banking sector, I perceive that it's still they are kind of still coping with the current crisis, and there there is a lot of activity around managing the government schemes, uh, managing the deferral of payments, for example, the banking sector and Less so in the insurance sector. Obviously, the insurance sector has been potentially, you could argue, less impacted operationally. But the, there is something about the, the great reset of when, once we move to more normality, and probably building on some of the points that Aileen and Ronald made at the beginning as well, of really reevaluating the risk profile of the organization going forward, uh, with many people now working from home, with the potentially increased level of cyber risks and data risks with the different well-being challenges and moral challenges and managed capability, but at the same time opportunities to bring capabilities in a different way. So there is something about kind of a great reset on how you uh, manage the organization in the new normal, which will require from a risk management perspective, probably rethinking through the risk strategy, the risk appetite that you will have to certain risks, and maybe taking the opportunity to really building on the story of the positive side of COVID-19 on solidifying the operational resilience capabilities of the organization. Oh, so that, that's great. That, that sort of moves us into a, a, a board conversation. So I'd just like to ask the, the, the question to the, to the entire panel about uh, the board supporting the business and its ex executives. So in, in your view and your, your experience, how does the board support the business, its executives, um, in order to meet the operational resilience um, requirements, whether these are regulatory or actually uh, in putting them in place um, in their organization. Uh, this was a question that I was going to ask you, but also uh, coming is a similar question coming from, from, the pan, from the floor as well. So if I can continue, and I think it's kind of uh, reiterating some of the points I made earlier. Um, I think, again, there are a number of uh, regulatory artifacts and requirements coming on operational resilience, which actually will help a lot in terms of uh, having a more structured discussion internally around how to manage operational resilience and escalating and making decisions. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot about having a clear mindset, clear purpose and accountability. And I think the board has a critical role on ensuring and providing challenge and facilitating this debate in terms of making sure that the operational resilience program is linked to a business outcome and to a strategic outcome. And so that period of reflection with the management team and really making sure that really this, this is something that brings value to the organization strategically, I think is, is, is quite important. So driving that debate around the why we are doing this, what's the benefits, what actually, what's a, actually how far we want to go because operational resilience is actually quite tricky from the you will say from the return perspective, you need how you 
how far you want to go in terms of building redundancy and buffer. Obviously, this is about probably going against the logic that we had in the past, which is around being very effective and having the minimum investment to some extent. So I think that kind of tension around building redundancy at the cost of reducing your returns is, again, a very strategic debate. So there are a number of strategic debates that I think the board should play a key role. Jose, on that point, uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, we've had an earlier question which really links with this. So uh, the question that's coming through is, is an operational resilience a value proposition uh, pointing to an enabler for a more mature enterprise risk management proposition in that organization? Yeah, it's a great question, and I've been reflecting on this a lot as well, because, I mean, you could argue that many organizations, in particular banks or insurance companies, even with the, because of the regulatory regime that we have solvency to and the capital models that we have, you can say that there is a very structured approach to think about the risk base or returns of kind of the financial aspects of our decision. So you make a decision because you have a payback period of number of years so you have a return on the other hand operational resilience is about building buffer it's really about redundancy it's about investing for a potential uh, uh, difficult event and and it's quite difficult to put a, a number to monetize this and to say why should we invest on this so it goes, it goes against kind of a bit of the, the the traditional logic of how we make decisions and um, so I think there is kind of more to, and maybe as, as a risk profession, more to think about how we actually help the board or the management teams to really, again, not put the numbers, but to really bring in a structural way this debate around the value of operational resilience. And, and it's, it's quite hard, it's quite difficult. I think for me, Socrates, and where, where I sit at the moment and following on from Jose's answer, I think really what I'm then looking for the board to do probably is to really focus on, you know, the protection of the customer experience, I guess. So, and, and therefore, you know, to Jose's point about, you know, people are mostly looked at the financial aspects of projects projects or investment or you know building your architecture I, I think you know the board can then come from a different lens of well what's going to be the experience for the customer how, how do we protect that uh, and and you know drive challenge based more on that than the financial aspects maybe to make sure then that we are making those right you know investment decisions or risk-based decisions um, and, and obviously you know the board are really front and center of setting the risk type, I think, in that regard. Um, so uh, really looking at the board, you know, to, to then hold us to that risk appetite that's been set and challenges, you know, where they see that maybe some of, some of the, the decisions or the proposals that are being made could take us outside of that appetite. Jenny, on, on that point, um, and obviously you've had practical experience here. What are the challenges of, of moving the, the sort of top-down message into the first line ownership and understanding of you know what first line now needs to be um, owning and, and, and doing? Uh, it's a new set of requirements, a new set of way of way of working. Uh, it's a similar question that's coming from, from the panel. Um, how, how have you done that at HSBC? I mean, we 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 are, you know, so much more focused, I think, now on on customer outcomes, um, and, and that message and tone is absolutely coming down from the top. And, and I think to your point, you know, that that tone from the top and cascade is absolutely key. Um, and you know, really, I guess the board looking at, you know, what what can they do to help us in terms of those investment decisions, and maybe you know, remove some of the blockers where maybe there are some blockers, etc. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, giving regular presentations, talking about, you know, what's, what's important to them in terms of the board, you know, what keeps them awake at night so that, you know, the, the wider audience in the organization really understand, you know, what's the board's view on this and, and what's important to them um, and driving that message down through that, I think, as well. 
um, and being proactive in that, you know, and trying to look forward at, at maybe, you know, I've talked about the horizon scanning report and it's about, you know, looking at what is on the horizon and, and looking at how maybe they can influence the investment decisions to make sure that some of those horizon risks, you know, are, are absolutely addressed proactively. Jenny, that's brilliant. I'm just monitoring the time here. As time has rolled forward uh, big time. We've only got five minutes to go. May I ask you all just one piece of advice on your experience and what would you like to sort of leave with the panel? Um, please keep sending questions in. I'm, I'm recording all the questions and we'll try and get back to you after after this session. But you know, just sort of departing comments um, on based on your experience that can help our, our audience. I'll, I'll start off and be very brief. It's, it's one of my key challenges, and I mentioned it earlier. But, but my, my piece of advice and guidance would be: do not underestimate the amount of effort and resource that will be required, you know, to map and maintain your important business services and processes, and, and to understand the risks that present and how effective your controls are. Aileen, yeah, I, I, yeah. Look, I think from a from a board or even a CRO perspective, I think the question is, what does that mean for our resilience? I think um, pivot pivot the thinking when you're introducing new technology, a new product, a new third party. What does that do for our resilience? Um, and move away from maybe what might be in place is a kind of annual resilience assessment it, it needs to be dynamic and that would be my advice i'm posing yeah almost like building on on the same theme i will say and also from engaging with board members and, and organizations i think i will say engaging with board members early on um, bringing them on, on the journey is key for the success of this uh, program. Whether you are thinking from meeting the regulatory expectations or whether you are thinking about driving operational resilience, having that tone from the top sponsorship, but at the same time helping board members because this is going to be challenging. Uh, kind of uh, this learning curve, as I mentioned, I think is uh, would be critical. Brilliant. Um, and, and Ronan, any departing <laughs> comments from, from your sort of point of view? Yes, absolutely. I mean, be, be, be prepared. I think, um, unfortunately, there's a lot more emerging risks on the horizon. Uh, climate risk is, of course, talked about as an even, unfortunately, even bigger um, challenge than COVID. So be prepared. Um, expect the unexpected. Prepare. Do your stress scenarios. As, as Alien said, be dynamic. It's not something that should be left on the shelf. Get other people, everyone involved. And then very much as I say, you know, connect with your people, show leadership. Um, you know, take care of your people. People risk is very important to you, um, and then uh, then you'll be in a good place. Thank you so much for for your thoughts. Thank you all for uh, for your questions. Um, so this concludes our, our one hour uh, session. Uh, this recording will be made available, so you can come back to it uh, at your leisure. Um, please look out for the survey um, and, and further comments pull these together and send it to you via the IRM. Uh, thank you so much. Have a pleasant afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and, and keep well. Thank you, Socrates. Thank you, Socrates. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure. Thank you.